my name is Heidi Pease. I'm head of investment products at Wave Financial. And for today's session, we are thrilled to present the maturing Bitcoin's derivative, derivatives market. We have our special guest, Benjamin Sai, who is president, managing partner, and co-founder at Wave, Wave Financial. And as I said before, he is what we consider our resident crypto professor because he teaches crypto finance at UCLA Anderson, my alma mater. Uh, and then we're thrilled to have um, as our special guest, Simon Morgan, who's the current head of exchanges and he's the market maker at, at Copper, uh, which most of us probably know Copper is one of the most highly sought best in class custodians. He's gonna talk not just about what they do for digital asset custody, but some of the trading solutions that they provide. So with that said, uh, just for the audience members to know that this is a fireside chat, I'll be throwing out some topics to both Ben and Simon, uh, but it's really free flowing and they're going to go ahead and riff off of each other. I, if you do have a question, please pop that question into the chat. We'd love to hear from you and I will address those questions most likely at the end of the session. We are recording this session, so we will make this copy available to all of those that have registered. So with that, I'd love to turn the time over to Ben and Simon. Ben, could you please start off and introduce yourself in greater detail? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Benjamin Tsai. I'm one of the co-founders of Wave Digital Assets. Uh, just a quick one on my background and why I'm talking about derivatives today. Uh, after business school, I spent about 15 years in traditional finance. I ran structured products for Merrill Lynch for about 12 years. And during that time, I, I used a lot of derivatives on both the equity and the fixed income side. And that's part of why I thought it'd be interesting to have a discussion on uh, derivatives for, uh, for crypto. Uh, separate from that, I also ran the crypto, uh, the commodities business for what was at that point Bank of America Merrill Lynch across Asia. And thereafter, I spent a number of years uh, on the buy side with Alliance Bernstein as head of alternative investments. Uh, the other interesting fact is that uh, I was based in Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan. So I was licensed as a securities representative in all of those countries and the U.S. So sat through a lot of exams during my 15 years in Asia and uh, really have a, a good feel for the regulatory environment uh, with regards to finance. Uh, about uh, seven years ago, I came back to the U.S. I went down the rabbit hole of blockchain cryptocurrencies, um, uh, did some nonprofit work with Heidi, and uh, we started uh, Wave Financial about four and a half years ago. So th that's me in a nutshell. Simon, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your background as well. Hello, hi. Yes, um, Simon Morgan. I am currently the head of uh, exchanges and uh, market makers here at uh, Copper, which basically means I run all of our major exchange relationships, all the centralized crypto exchanges and some of our big market making clients. Um, my background, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an equity guy. I, was, uh, I used to run equity sales trading EMEA for Virtue Financial um, uh, latterly. So I joined Copper in early 2022. But I was in the equity markets for 22, 23 years, something like that. And similarly, like Ben, I actually started at Merrill Lynch many, many moons ago, too. So um, a markets guy through and through, seen many of these cycles up and down, good and bad, and somehow find myself in this weird and wonderful world of crypto. But uh, delighted to be here. My derivative knowledge would not be anywhere near as extensive as Ben's, but I can certainly speak to some of the solutions we have in place to help the market evolve and uh, hopefully provide everyone a bit of clarity and comfort about the future. Simon, did you ever think that you would be talking about derivatives in Bitcoin? If you'd asked me that three years ago, I'd say absolutely <laughs> no way, but I'm delighted to be here. So very right, exciting. Well well, welcome. Thank you so much. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, again, this is taking me back to my MBA days, but Ben, perhaps you could help us better understand a little bit about what are Bitcoin der derivatives and how do they compare with other types of non-crypto derivatives? Sure. I think um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with actually, you know, what is, uh, you know, kind of the size of the market and so forth. So um, we've been I've been looking at the derivatives market for quite a while. And this is something that is uh, very interesting to me. 
uh, it's since, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with derivatives in the traditional markets, I thought that, you know, uh, looking at the derivatives in the crypto market when we got started in crypto was something that uh, made a lot of sense. So um, within derivatives market, there are generally two different kinds uh, of, of derivatives that, uh, you know, people deal, typically deal with. One side is futures and the other side is options. I think today our conversation would probably end up being a little more options oriented. And this is something that, uh, you know, we work with uh, with copper on, um, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, on the derivative side, uh, the bulk of the derivatives are traded more on the future side. Uh, typically, people use futures for hedging or to take leverage positions, as in being able to take a larger position than uh, the initial capital that is required. So that is one way to look at and, and use uh, futures. And uh, in terms of options, it's actually more flexible because of the way the payouts could be structured. It could be used for um, for hedging. Certainly, people buying puts as a hedge to their position. It could be used as a, a way to accumulate when uh, when uh, crypto is down. For example, doing uh, selling put options. It could also be used to generate yield as people selling call options that are far away of to to typically generate yield and not lose Bitcoin or not lose crypto in general. And um, some people also use it for disposal where you're selling call options very close to the money. And by doing that, uh, there's a potential to sell and at the same time generate a lot of yield. We actually employ some of these uh, strategies for our clients on the platform, and they've been very effective in the past few years. Great. And, and um, you, you mentioned that this is a, quite a robust market already. You know, Bitcoin right now is hovering about 500 billion market cap. And I think at its all time high was approaching 1.3 trillion. With that said, how robust is the derivatives marketplace for Bitcoin? And how have you seen it mature over the years? And actually, when did it start to even be a market? Sure. It started a, a number of years ago, and the biz, biggest market is actually Binance uh, for um, the futures market. A, a lot of that is being traded on the futures side. I believe the market is roughly half the size of the spot market, which is, you know, from traditional finance people's perspective, a big opportunity. In traditional finance, the futures market or the options market uh, combined or the derivatives market as a whole is multiples bigger than the spot market. And because of that, um, you know, I, I find it very interesting that the derivatives market is still a fraction of the uh, the spot market right now in crypto. And I believe there should be potential for a lot of growth. Uh, drilling even further in, looking at the options market within that, uh, and just looking at Bitcoin, it's a very interesting field. Uh, at the end of last year, when in you know when people were not so interested in having uh, you know options, the open interest or the amount of options that are outstanding was all the way down to about two point five billion, which is a very low number in the grand scheme of things in the historical of things. Uh, and this market's been around for about two and a half, three years now. So two and a half billion, uh, you know, is really low in that historical scale. But right now, open interest, you know, just since early this year has ramped up significantly. A lot of people taking a lot more positions, either on the long on the short side, on um, on options. And right now, the outstanding market open interest is about 13 billion. And daily volume, um, you know, was probably down to about 10 billion at the end of last year. And it's close to 30 billion right now. And that's just volume traded. So uh, one of the things we'll talk about a little bit later is, are the markets. And for options, the largest market is actually Deribit, which is a little bit of a surprise because a lot of people don't really know about Deribit. Deribit is a listed market that is in uh, based in the Panamas. I think they used to be uh, based in Amsterdam. They moved the Panamas. And we do a lot of trade on that exchange. And that's also where we work uh, closely with Copper on. So uh, that's something we'll talk about a bit more. But the Deribit options market is is over 90% of the total options market. All the other markets combined uh, is equal to less than 10% of that volume. And the next biggest players are Delta Exchange, OKX, and Binance. And those are the three markets that are uh, participating in the space, but are very small. 
Uh, so uh, in comparison, just looking at the U.S. only market, the CME U.S. market is 1.4 billion in volume compared to, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, um, uh, you know, um, 30 billion of, of, of trading volume internationally. So that's, uh, you know, 20x. Uh, so it's 5% of the total volume out, you know, in the world. And also the CME open interest is 1.2 billion versus a $13 billion market. So that's, a, you know, 10x. So it's it's about 10% of total, uh, global volume in terms of uh, open interest. And it's about 5% of volume in terms of uh, traded uh, volume in the U.S. And this is just for Bitcoin. Uh, I think there is also a listed market for Ethereum. And I think there's starting to be a nascent market for so a few other tokens like uh, Solana and others. So you mentioned that last year there was something about 10 billion daily volume, and that has now increased to 30 billion uh, daily volume. Why was there this drop last year and, and or why is there an increase this year? So the, the increase this year is really on the interest in Bitcoin. Uh, as the Bitcoin market started to rally, there was a lot of interest in taking more exposure. There's also a belief that uh, the uh, interest rate rising cycle is starting starting to come off to a uh, you know a, a more stable place. Uh, and I think there is a you know kind of light at the end of the tunnel. So people are starting to take uh, risk. Uh, take on risk assets once again, and Bitcoin being one of the higher volatility, riskier assets. So people are uh, starting to take position. And you can certainly see this in the spot market. We've gone from about uh, 15,000 to uh, 26,000. So quite a significant increase just uh, on Bitcoin alone, I think it was up 40% in January. So that increase is what's driving, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, this movement forward. And, and this movement forward, uh, you know, is also driving the derivatives interest people are taking more futures and options positions to have, uh, you know, to have uh, to be long uh, call options or, uh, you know, and I think some people are also predicting a correction from, you know, 25,000 back down. And for those that believe that they're potentially buying put options to try to make money from a, a drop in that position. Yeah, so you were mentioning just to add that. To that ben, to your, oh, sorry, Heidi, I was I'll just going to say something. just to just to your point. Um, and we know this from, from markets generally, like price leads everything, doesn't it? And, and as we see prices rise, you see interest increase and, and more and more people become active again. I mean, as you rightly said before, Deribit is quite a large options ex exchange and it's one of our major venues that we support at, at Copper. Um, and we have seen a record month actually this month in terms of volume traded uh, on our Clearly product, which I'll come on to later on. Um, but it's just an interesting little tidbit, given that Clearly was a brand for quite a while, but we're seeing huge traction. Um, and it just speaks to your point, really, about, about more and more going on the derivatives market broadly. Yeah, thank you. That's fascinating to learn that and that we're just really at a small fraction of what this potentially could be. Um, but it sounds like there's a lot more to structuring a derivative rather than the increase in price and or the interest in that underlying asset. How, what is a smart way, and now this is taking me back to my Anderson days, uh, my derivatives class. Can you explain uh, what is a smart way to structure a Bitcoin derivative? So like what kind of out of, uh, out of the money are we talking about or spot? Just in general, could you provide a little bit of background on that? Sure. Um, so we um, do a lot of uh, cover call transactions for a lot of the tokens that we have. We actually have a product called the Bitcoin Income and Growth Product, where we're, which we're doing uh, cover calls on a monthly basis on Bitcoin. We're typically looking at the market. We're doing the transactions at the end of every month uh, where the old options expire. So we set up new options. And what we're doing is we're selling call options on the Bitcoin that we hold. What that does is it converts the volatility and some of the upside potential into an actual dividend, and that dividend could be paid out to the clients. Uh, what we're typically looking at is what our uh, you know, what our feel for the upside of the market is. And we typically are selling call options that are maybe 10 to 20% uh, 
um, well, probably come, uh, you know sometimes more out of the money, depending on how bullish we are with the market. Now, obviously, the further out of the money we sell, the smaller the premium is, and therefore the smaller the dividend we're able to give to the clients. So it's a balance between you know taking the money up front or, or leaving it for uh, leaving the potential for Bitcoin to run and for us to capture that potential. So those are our kind of uh, the, the type of things that we do uh, as a way of structuring it. Obviously, there are other ways of, of using this by, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, buying put options as protection or selling put options, you know, out of the money to try to collect some Bitcoin if, if it was to go down. Uh, but these are all, uh, you know, ways that, uh, you know, people use uh, options on. Is there a secret sauce, Ben, that you apply to this or do you just mostly look at historical uh, performance of Bitcoin when you're structuring a derivative? There's really not much of a secret sauce from that perspective. I think it's really more just about looking at the, you know the data points out there and uh, you know as many data points as possible. Uh, you know, one set is uh, you know where is the spot market going? Kind of our prediction on the spot market. Uh, the second is on where we think uh, you know whether volatility is is reasonably priced, cheap, or expensive. Uh, we're not so active in trading the volatility itself, volatility itself, but it's certainly something we look at. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, um, we're trying to find that right balance between the amount of dividends the clients get and versus, uh, you know, how much of a strike we can leave and how much headroom we can leave for Bitcoin to run. Uh, you know, our product targets uh, over, you know, one and a half percent a month, and we've been able to achieve that for the past, uh, you know, three and a half years of running this product. Um, and Simon, you mentioned that you've seen a real tick up in the use of Clearloop, which I know we're going to get into in just a little bit, um, uh, especially over the past few months. Would you say that crypto derivatives are becoming more of a common investment vehicle? Are they already a common investment vehicle? Where are we? And that could be this question is for either you, Simon or Ben. Yeah, I mean, there's no question in my mind, you know, all our customers are all institutional and, you know, the the, the big sort of um, play we see here, and this is why Clearloop has been built the way it's been built, is to serve for the derivatives market mainly. You know, the, the, there is huge upside, as Ben said before, more and more, you know, the, the most common thing that people trade is really perps, um, options less so, but that is building too. You know, our, our actual client participation in spot is, is not as big actually at, at copper and, and particularly using clearly because it is would be trading derivatives. So, so yes, very much we are focused on, on helping, you know, provide solutions for, for our clients to actually trade these instruments in a safe and secure manner. Um, and as you said, we can come on to how we do that a little bit later. I mean, you mentioned, uh, I'm so sorry, Ben, did you say you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I, I think that's great. So, yeah. Uh, Simon, you mentioned that you're seeing more and more of your institutional users start engaging and providing derivatives. Are these institutional um, clients, without giving away names, I'm just curious, are they traditional finance institutions that are getting more into the space or are they very specific crypto um, firms? Yeah. It, that, I mean, that, that is a very good question and, and a very fair question. So, I mean, to provide a bit of color on that, when I joined Copper, um, what, the start of last year, the, my initial remit really, given my background, was to start talking to the traditional buy side, to the traditional asset management firms, hedge funds, et cetera, that are all moving into the space. And it's fair to say at that point in time, they were all gearing up in various ways to start trading crypto in a much more uh, formulated way than perhaps they had been before. So, all the big multi strats, et cetera, et cetera, we're all, we're all getting ready to, to get going. Sadly, a few of them have, have pulled out or have paused their, their you know, plans to do that, given what's happened in, in crypto over the last 12 months, which is perfectly understandable. Um, so our client base really is, is, is a, an element of that. So we have an element of traditional asset managers who, are, who have pivoted into this space and, and we have tools really to support them. But I suppose that, that the... Our biggest sort of customer at the moment would be native crypto hedge funds. Um, we also have plenty of actual crypto foundations on our books. So we have a variety of customer, but really the way Copper was set up, it was always the intention to serve the asset management community. So whether they be crypto native hedge funds or traditional asset managers, we feel we have the tools built appropriately to serve them in particular. 
And needless to say, I should actually point out, given my title, that of course we deal with a lot of market makers who are who are very active in this space and provide liquidity in, on virtually every venue. So. Yeah, fascinating. Is there a certain geolocation that you see more of an interest? For example, do you see more of these traditional financial institutions coming out that were going to provide more derivatives coming out of Europe, North America? Is there a particular geo penetration? <laughs> well, jurisdiction is becoming increasingly tricky, as I think we're all figuring out. So, um, I mean, obviously, anyone we have been trying to service in the US, they, they sort of need to set up offshore at this point to access any sort of offshore exchanges where the most liquidity is. So there's clearly a, a change going on in going on stateside. Um, you know, we have a huge amount of business coming out of London. Uh, we also have a Swiss office where there is, uh, which is based in Zug, which is part of Crypto Valley. So there's a lot of interest there. And of course, the APAC region, you know, given all the major offshore exchanges are all pretty much APAC based or, or, or it st certainly started in the APAC region. We have a, you know, we have an office in Singapore and, and see a, a large amount of business coming in from Asia. So, you know, we have a very much a global footprint. We are a European business by registration and our headquarters are here in London. Um, and I do suspect that increasingly some of the real big, large, you know, asset managers will start moving their folk who are interested in digital assets to to Europe or the Middle East or, or Asia and, and probably sadly less so in the US given the regulatory uh, issues at, at the moment. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about regulation as well. Um, but speaking of geolocation, Ben, I understand that our WBIG, um, which is our Bitcoin uh, Income and Growth Fund, Really, the impetus for that started out of Asia. Maybe you could talk, and, and I and I believe Wave was one of the first to launch a Bitcoin futures fund. Could you maybe talk a little bit about why that came out of Asia? And I, and I think that there was an interest in returns and um, what kind of typical returns have we seen? And before we get into that, I was just flagged by our compliance team to make sure that we mentioned that past performance is not necessarily uh, indicative of future performance, but please, please jump into that. Yeah, sure. I think, uh, you know, uh, there have been always funds that use the futures market, but I think we're one of the first few that was using the options market exclusively as a feature of our fund. Uh, I don't know of another, uh, you know, kind of Bitcoin options uh, fund that is taking advantage of the options market for yield exclusively and, and using that as kind of a, a way of generating yield for the fund. So uh, I'd like to think we're the first, although once again, you know, I, I can't guarantee there's a there's a fund somewhere that that has did, has been doing it before us. Uh, what we decided to do when we first started this was really looking at uh, you know, what we can do for as a Bitcoin product. And I think a lot of feedback we got was that Bitcoin's interesting, but the volatility is too high. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, well, if the volatility is too high, let's use that to our advantage. Let's do something with that. Uh, the other aspect, which I'm, uh, you know, uh, after spending 15 years creating uh, financial products for clients in Asia, um, there's always a great interest for uh, yield products, products that pay out a yield uh, on a regular basis. And, you know, a lot of the high net worth clients we service in Asia are already quite well to do. They're not trying to hit it out of the ballpark. They're really looking for consistent income that can come in. And so we thought that that would be interesting to combine the idea of trying to trade in this excessive volatility for a yield that makes a lot of sense. And the yield that we're seeing and the volatility that we're seeing in crypto is much higher than traditional finance. And that um, and that makes our product extremely attractive. We're able to uh, you know, generate a yield that's large enough for people to be interested. At the same time, the, the strikes are not at the money and, and you know, really uh, capping the upside of the underlying. So that fine balance um, you know, has, has done really well for us. And that's why we're able to create this product. And 
And once again, the, the past performance doesn't guarantee that the future performance of the product, but we've been able to do quite well with it. Uh, you know, uh, about uh, for 2021, I think Bitcoin was up 300%. We were able to capture 200% of that along with paying out a, a stream of income, which is, uh, you know, a, a very convenient feature for a lot of, uh, you know, clients that want that. Also, uh, in a down market or in a slightly less up market in, in 22, um, sorry, that was 20. In 21, the uh, market was up about uh, 63%, and we were able to deliver uh, close to 90% returns for clients because of the coupon that we were paying. Uh, and, and that market, from a crypto derivatives per, or crypto perspective or a Bitcoin perspective, is a relatively uh, flat market. Yes, it's up 60%, but it was very, uh, you know, it was up early in the year and it was down latter half of the year. So overall, it was a, 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 a not a uh, not, not such a violently upward or downward moving market. And uh, last year, it was a, a downward market, and we outperformed Bitcoin by about 10%. Bitcoin was down about 65 and we're delivering somewhere in um, the, the, the down 50 55% uh, level. So uh, we're able to outperform because of that coupon stream that we, uh, you know, we were paying out. Uh, so that that is how we're seeing it. Uh, you know, the the yield is there to really kind of buffer the ups and downs of Bitcoin. It's converting that volatility into something a little more constant, a little more stable, and that's what the clients like to see. Those are pretty um, high returns. Do, do you think that those returns, those higher returns, are sustainable over the long run? Um, I think we're capturing these returns from a structural uh, basis, and therefore the um, the returns are uh, you know uh, quite stable from a uh, volatility perspective. So as long as Bitcoin stays volatile, I believe that we can capture this um, this level of return. So um, that outperformance versus Bitcoin is really what we're we're hoping to to generate over the long term. And we've been running this fund for over three years, and we're able to show that in uh, market conditions conditions, you know, we're able to do that. I, I think the only scenario is that when, you know, Bitcoin significantly, significantly outperforms like the, uh, you know, 2020, uh, you know, 300% rise, a 3x rise, we're only able to capture two thirds of that. But, uh, you know, most clients are, are happy to capture two thirds of that and also have that cash flow stream. So uh, overall, we believe that that is uh, sustainable and will continue. Great. Um mm -hmm. I'm going to ask yeah, Simon something. I think most of us are aware, obviously, that copper is a leading custodian. But um, tell us, Simon, how does copper fit into this whole derivatives play? Um, what kind of solution does copper provide in general? Yep. And what role does a custodian play in, in just Bitcoin derivatives? So, I mean, I, I think, thank you for that, Heidi. I, I think the starting point is, is clearly custody is, is the basis for any financial market, um, particularly so with crypto when you're dealing with essentially bearer assets and, and hacking risk, et cetera, et cetera. So using a third party custodian is for any institution is hugely important. Um, so, you know, we at Copper have various ways of protecting assets. We use something called NPC technology and, and, and I actually won't go into the details of the, of the actual custody piece, but needless to say, we have... You know very advanced ways of actually doing that the thing i would like to flag the most is, is our flagship product which is something called clearly which you've heard me uh, refer to already so if i explain how the majority trade crypto today and this is an institutional way whether they use a custodian or not the majority still have to pre-fund exchanges and what that means is essentially you are sending your assets from your custody whether that be with a custodian or your own self-custody wallet, you are sending those assets to an exchange. And all of a sudden, those assets are now sat on that exchange. So you are taking you know, a, a large counterparty risk exposure versus that exchange, um, which really is something we don't think institutions should be doing. And we've been preaching about this since 2020 when clearly it was launched. So this isn't actually a reaction to the events of last year, but to highlight it front and center, the FTX situation clearly hurt a lot of people. Um, and, and you think about all those assets that were sat on that exchange are, are either lost or, or are going to be tied up in bankruptcy proceedings for the next God knows how long. Um, so what clearly really does is allow our institutional clients to trade on exchange from their safe custody accounts at Copper. 
So instead of actually moving your assets from copper to the exchange, the assets remain in copper custody, but we do what we call delegate. So via an API call, let's say you've got one Bitcoin in your account, your safe copper custody account, you would delegate that one Bitcoin to your Clearleaf exchange. That one Bitcoin then appears on your exchange account, which is your initial margin or your buying power, but crucially has not left your copper account. So now you, you are mitigating that counterparty risk versus the exchange. Your relationship with the exchange, the client exchange relationship is not changed at all. You can, you can trade away and you're safe in the knowledge that your assets are still sat safely at a third party custodian. So that separation of church and state, which is fundamental in TradFi, is something we've been trying to bring in for a while. Now, the biggest issue we had, quite frankly, was getting exchanges to sign up to Clearloop. Because if you think about uh, the world of crypto, exchanges have been acting like broker dealers to a degree. They've had these vertically integrated businesses where they, where they have the exchange part, they have the custody part, et cetera, et cetera. Now, FTX made this front and center why this was a major issue for the industry and for, and for the industry to move forward. You know, we all believe that there has to be that separation of church and state. And so we've seen a huge influx of both clients and exchanges wanting to use clearly, um, which, which is great news. However, what we have also done, and I think to, to maintain Copper as the market leader in this sort of sphere, and there are other custodians trying to do similar things, which, which we welcome, and, and you know, it's obviously very flattering that they're, they're trying to imitate clearly to a degree, but we've moved this on. And now, instead of just protecting your initial margin, because that doesn't leave your Copper custody account, we're also uh, aiming to protect any open P&L you have. So this is where it comes in big time if you're trading derivatives. So in this scenario, you, you send your one Bitcoin to the exchange via delegation, but it's still sat at copper. You open a position in a derivative. And let's assume that you are now accruing some open P&L. We would require the exchange to hold sufficient collateral plus a buffer that at any time during the life cycle of that trade that they can settle that trade should the client need to do so. So now we are protecting client's initial margin because it doesn't move. And we're also protecting their open PL. Now, the beauty of this structure, this is all underpinned by an English law governed legal trust, which we've had written up by one of the, the world's largest law firms, which basically makes it a, an almost a bankruptcy remote vehicle. So you're also removing the risk of an insolvency of copper, because a lot of what clients will say is, well, all I'm doing is moving my, my counterparty risk from the exchange to copper. And we say, well, well that's fair enough. But I would argue to the cows come home that our, our, our ability to secure your assets in a safe custody environment are better than any exchange would be, because that is our sole job. But also we're giving them that protection of this trust, because should any participant within the Clearloop network become insolvent, those assets are protected by the trust and would be divvied up accordingly and wouldn't be held up in any bankruptcy proceedings. So we see this as sort of the future state of changing market structure. We're excited to say we've sort of signed up. Uh, we had three incumbent exchanges already. We signed up another, an additional five um, since the FTX situation. Uh, and we have a, a long pipeline of, of plenty more that we'll be integrating throughout the rest of this year. In fact, we have a, a major announcement which will be coming out to the market um, next Monday. Um, and as Ben rightly said, you know, Deribit has been one of our uh, clearly exchanges from the start. They've actually been on since 2020. So we have a lot of experience of dealing with um with the derivative market which is which is really all they do um and yeah so it's uh, you know it, it's a pretty innovative product i would also add again which i think is fairly unique to crypto is that monitoring all these positions is we have a 24 7 risk team all of whom have you know long distinguished back backgrounds from tradfi so they very much understand what they're doing um and and we monitor that entire situation so uh, clients should take a lot of comfort from that that you know, we're protecting their initial margin and we're protecting their open PL and, and mitigating all of that risk for them. Uh, that yeah, that, that was an excellent. So just a little bit of information, Simon, we've been working with numerous distribution partners who uh, through their due diligence process have really been diving deeply into the risk management at Copper. And you know, the team has walked away 
very happy. Uh, obviously, you have insurance for once the assets are custodied as well. Um, so very, you know, very impressed with your overall risk management. And I understand that you're also working on a collateral management process. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, it's really in a in a very similar sort of uh, tech builder as Clearloop is. You know, when I talked about delegating assets, now we're talking about pledging assets. So the, the, the first um, sort of iteration of this product should be live um, at the end of next month, where, you know, again, post FTX, the lending and borrowing market sort of blew up. Um, lenders wanted uh, collateral in place. They didn't want to lend uncollateralized anymore, really, for obvious reasons. Um, and so we're basically building this collateral management platform, which will allow lenders to lend. And now, instead of the borrower actually having to send um, collateral to the lender, they can pledge those assets to the lender, uh, which the lender will be able to visibly see. And should there be an event of default, the lender can actually claim those assets via an account control agreement. So that's, that's going to be the initial phase which we think will help open the market back up and encourage people to lend uh, a bit more freely because that market is extremely tight right now. And that's obviously hugely important for the, for the markets to function as we all want them to. Um, and then we have more ideas of, of, of actually, uh, you know, second, third phase of this sort of thing where you can think about a situation where a borrower could pledge assets to, um, sorry, a lender could, could pledge assets to a borrower who could then pledge those assets to an exchange and, and Copper can basically manage that collateral process all the way through. So all we're trying to do really is help grease the wheels of, of this whole um, whole market to make it more efficient and, and just basically help manage collateral. That's all Copper is going to do in this. We're not getting involved in the terms of loan agreements or anything of that nature. We're just providing the tech and the rails to allow the market to function in a, in a bit of a more grown up way, really. Do you think that these new rails that you're providing and transparency tools overall might help uh, satisfy some of the regulators as it uh, as they're peering more into exchanges and crypto in general? Well, I mean, I, you know, that's obviously a very hot topic and, and who knows exactly what's going to happen. There's regulatory arbitrage around the world and we're right in the middle of that, trying to figure out where we want to be and where we want to be regulated. But um I, I, I would agree with what I think you're implying, and I think it's incumbent on anybody involved in the institutional crypto space to actually build products and operate in a grown up manner that can prove to, or demonstrate to the regulator that this industry can actually behave and act in, in the appropriate way, um, whether that's through building products or just actual, you know, compliance and, and all the basic stuff which we take for granted in in the TradFi world. We need to start bringing some of this in here. And, and you know, we're very much proponents of that. Um, and, and hopefully that message sort of gets across whereby the regulator actually just, you know, we demonstrate what we're doing as opposed to actually telling them what to do. Um, but it's, it's a long, arduous process. There's no question about that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Speaking about regulation, uh, you know, I, I think that, that that the argument of let's let's get ahead and show regulators what we're doing versus from the behind of what we should have done. But I know that this regulation is definitely a hot topic, especially here in the US. Um, ben, we were in DC a couple weeks ago meeting with regulators from the CFTC, former SEC, um, and so forth. I'm curious, based upon those discussions and with your leadership in the market, how do you see regulation may affect returns and, and the derivatives market as a whole? Yeah, I think the derivatives market discussion is very tough. Uh, CFTC has taken a, a, a stance around, uh, you know, what can be built in the U.S. As I mentioned, the CME volume is uh, maybe one-fifth uh, in terms of uh, volume and one-tenth in terms of open interest versus the global market, which is very odd. Most financial instruments, financial transactions, the U.S. plays a large part in it. And it doesn't in the U.S. because the U.S. has been, uh, you know, quite, uh, you know, uh, quite tight on the regulatory side. Um, one of the other things is I think CME is set up so that you need to go through a clearinghouse in order to access the market as opposed to a direct access. And that, I think, is also becoming a problem. We've spoken with clearinghouses before about accessing U.S. liquidity. 
and that U.S. liquidity is just very tough because the clearinghouse expects a certain volume to go through and a certain amount of revenue that I'm supposed to be dropping with them. And it is not an efficient way to run some of these uh, you know, strategies that we tend to run that are longer term and fewer trades in the middle. Uh, and finally, I think one of the big things that there's a lack of clarity on uh, that is not only regulatory, but also on the tax side, uh, you know, revenues generated in the U.S. in terms of uh, derivatives and so forth and whether they qualify as uh, as trading so that they're exempt from kind of cross-border withholding tax and so forth, it is not uh, very clear. And therefore, uh, you know, I think there's a hesitancy for international uh, players to come onto the U.S. to use the U.S. market. So that's certainly one area. Uh, I think the regulators were, uh, we were able to meet were quite, quite frustrated, I think, at the setup. I think um, the regulators that we spent time with are probably on the same side as us. And not to sound like we're all in an echo chamber, but, you know, truly believe that the U.S. is starting to fall behind from a regulatory perspective. And the businesses are now starting to pick up thinking about or are starting to pick up and uh, moving overseas. And that is a real risk for this type of next generation, you know, technology, financial technology that uh, the U.S. is, uh, you know, kind of pushing away from. So uh, there's genuine concern there. Some of the regulators are, uh, you know, putting bills into Congress to try to put some clarity uh, on, to put some guide rails in. And uh, I think at Wave Digital Assets, we're very supportive of that, even if on the short term, some of the rules may or may not be to our benefit, uh, you know, over the longer term, I think having the clarity would really drive the market forward. One final thing I'll mention is that, um, you know, uh, some of the larger institutions we speak with, a lot of them are hesitant to be involved because of this greatness. And there's interest, but they're standing on the sideline waiting for that clarity. Mm -hmm. So once that clarity comes, I think there could potentially be a lot more pent up demand that would come into this market, which is a, an exciting thing for me. So that's kind of a silver lining in where we are right now. Uh, but uh, there's no guarantee that that those regulations will come through and come through, you know, favorably uh, or unfavorably. We just don't know uh, where they'll land uh, for this. And the topic itself is extremely complicated. I was very impressed at, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the the people that we've met and and their being up to speed on uh, on the on these complicated topics. But I think the people we were meeting uh, at are more kind of the exception rather than the rule, where the rest of Congress probably is not nearly as up to speed on blockchain technology uses and and proper ways to think about the new financial uh, infrastructure and ecosystem. Sorry, Heidi, I would chip in. I, I would agree with you, Ben, totally. And I think the confusion can be summed up in the last week alone, where you've got the CFTC referring to Ethereum as a commodity, and you've got the SEC referring to Ethereum as a security. So until this confusion gets cleared up and, and somebody actually makes a decision, it's very, very hard for anybody to plan a business uh, around trading this stuff out of the US. It, it's, it's near impossible. So we need some clarity, as you say. Yeah, and, and it really isn't for the CFTC or the SEC to decide on that. It really is for regulations to be passed, and they're really on the enforcement side. They're not on the legislative side, and they're certainly not on the judicial side to be kind of their own decision-making uh, you know, function. So from that perspective, I feel like they're overstepping their bounds. Uh, and there are people within the SEC that are pushing back also. So a lot of dissenting opinions from uh, uh, what Gary Gensler is uh, you know, pushing for. So uh, you know, from that perspective, it, it's, it's certainly interesting. I think the SEC, uh, you know, at, at one point had given up on pushing for Ethereum to be a security, but I think, you know, with the recent move towards uh, proof of stake, uh, you know, there, there, there's kind of a renewed interest for that, just because I think that um, the dialogue, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a gap for the dialogue to be changed. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're seeing also. In these meetings that we had in Washington, D.C., uh, somebody had an excellent example of what he thought the existing blockchain crypto uh, market is. And it's almost like we're driving on roads. They, they could be freeways. They could be roads, but there's no stop signs, no stoplights. We don't know what the speed limits are. We don't know if we can pass other cars or not. There's no rules. And we're driving on this this highway and the only time we know that there's rules is if somebody gets pulled over and once they get pulled over and we say oh he got pulled over for 
you know, going 15 miles per hour, I guess that's what the speed limit is. Um, so it's really regu uh, understanding regulation only really through enforcement at this point in time. With that said, and, and the use of that example, since we just do not have any really much regulatory clarity at this point, where do you see the future for the derivatives markets? And are there other opportunities for derivatives in ETH or other alt tokens like ADA or even digital assets such as NFTs or carbon credits? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and, and wrap up kind of the, the Washington, D.C. Uh, you know, so Heidi and I had one very positive meeting where we were welcomed and we were talking about doing more business and so forth. And that was the meeting we had at the embassy of the UAE. Right. So that was the only positive meeting we had there. And kind of the, the U.S. regulation really is. Uh, you know, much more negative. And from that perspective, I think the growth will really probably be more overseas rather than the U.S. on the short term. And that won't really improve until uh, things open up. And it's it's quite unfortunate. I think there was an exchange in the U.S. that was doing derivatives for retail for crypto, and that was Ledger X. FTX bought Ledger X, and, uh, you know, and we all know what happened to FTX. So uh, Ledger X really is, uh, you know, became kind of a, a weirdly functional but dysfunctional part of a bankrupt, you know, uh, entity type of issue. So uh, the status of that is, is not very clear. The licensing of that is not very clear. But that was one of the exchanges where you didn't need a clearing agent. Me as an individual, I can go and sign up for an account and I can trade derivatives. Uh, the liquidity was extremely thin. There's just not that much there on the retail, retail US only side. But that was a, a start. So in terms of future trends, unfortunately, I think it heads towards uh, the international side. Um, we are seeing uh, development of other uh, derivatives. We're looking at not only Bitcoin, but Ethereum, uh, you know, already being in existence. There's a market there. Uh, we're comfortable that it's deep enough to be able to do a lot more with that. Uh, so we're looking at potentially, uh, you know, creating an ETH derivatives uh, product also, uh, you know, now that we've done a Bitcoin one and the reception has been good. We're also looking at... Um, other protocols and having derivatives in those markets and help support and grow that market. We think that that's a very healthy thing for some of the top protocols that would really make a lot of sense. Okay. Think top five, think top 10 protocols and uh, their protocols having a listed uh, options market. And that's what we're uh, really uh, talking about and looking at right now. Uh, you know, separate from that, I think we're starting to see a, a growth of structured uh, structured products, so either structured notes, structured, uh, you know, uh, funds and so forth, where more complicated uh, option payouts are now being uh, built in. And that is really a reflection of what, uh, you know, what we were seeing in traditional finance. And uh, you know, I'm a big believer in crypto being another asset class in the in the whole finance space, and it's just kind of earlier. So whatever we saw, you know, developing equity and fixed income and commodities, uh, you know, to a certain extent, something similar will happen next in the uh, in the crypto market. And that's how I kind of think about it and operate. And that's how, uh, you know, we manage assets uh, on behalf of our clients. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would echo everything you said, Ben, and actually add to that that uh, increasingly from where I sit, you know, when I speak to all these exchanges, they are all looking at adding uh, options and altcoins and, and various other derivatives, um, you know, pretty soon, actually, which is, which is very encouraging because it just gives you, you know, more instruments to trade and optionality for clients, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the other thing I would say, I think, and this is what clearly does, and we've talked about structured trades, which, we, again, we think we can help you with via the clearly setup. But clearly, by its very nature, allows, you know, institutions you have various degrees of, of risk anxiety facing an exchange based in whether it be Panama or the Seychelles or some other dubious jurisdiction from a regulatory, regulatory perspective. Um, it sort of opens up that that window of opportunity for, for, for clients to trade on, on these offshore exchanges. So, um, you know, I only see that growing um, and the liquidity is, is going to continue to move offshore and, and, uh, and actually... As we said before, if the U.S. is slow to pick up the baton, I think I think it, the East certainly will. You know, we're starting to see Hong Kong passing some sort of legislation to try and welcome crypto a bit more, and and you know we all probably assume that is that is a proxy for China. So and the Middle East are extremely welcoming. So there's plenty of bright bright spots around the globe. 
it's just it's just a, a shifting time that's all yeah speaking of uh moving around the globe uh now we're we are moving into some of the audience questions um Ben, you mentioned that Darabit is located out of Panama. A question came up, is there any kind of risk that's associated with some with a, a market like a Darabit that's offshore? So risk for US investors? Uh, we operate our fund as an offshore fund. So um, I think that that's a, a little bit separate from kind of U.S. investor versus non-U.S. investor. We started trading there. We were delivering collateral to Deribit, them being a market that's greater than 90% of the total market. Uh, you know, it, 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 there's no way for us to not be trading on that exchange. So as we did that, we were not very comfortable delivering collateral to an exchange in Panama. That's part of why we teamed up with Copper and using Clearloop to be able to do trades there without actually delivering that collateral. So uh, we were actually one of the early uh, clients on that platform. We started doing that in 2020, and we we're very happy that we did. Just to add to that, I mean, we would be, I don't know the exact numbers, we're circa 10% of the, the daily volume that goes to Deribit via Clearloop. And I suspect that number will continue to grow um, as you know as people look to to mitigate exchange counterparty risk. Is there any potential for um, um, so an entity like CME to capture more of the derivatives market? They certainly can. I think if um, there is more interest for derivatives, if there are more, uh, you know, U.S. onshore funds that want to trade it, I think that that certainly is an angle. But I think right now, a lot of uh, hedge funds and a lot of kind of the more aggressive strategies tend to be based offshore. And there's not a need to to trade on the CME if you can trade on Deribit, where the volume, the, you know, the bulk of the volume is there, right? So, uh, you know, it, the CME is just such a small part of the total volume and open interest that's involved that, uh, you know, there's not a need to trade onshore. I think the people who trade onshore are people who have an internal corporate mandate to only trade onshore or something to that effect, or they're very U.S. without kind of any international connections for them to get access to the international markets. Um, we're coming down to just a few minutes and I've got a couple of questions. So I'm going to just rapid fire them to you. Uh, the first question is what happens if Bitcoin exceeds the strike price or conversely drops significantly <coughs> in something like, I'm assuming this is in regards to the, the fund, Ben. Yeah, mechanically, uh, we're selling call options. So if Bitcoin was to drop significantly, nothing happens to the call option, but the, the Bitcoin that we hold would drop in value and that, that this is not set up to protect the value of Bitcoin. And, and the product fundamentally is designed for uh, clients who are mildly bullish uh, Bitcoin. On the other hand, if Bitcoin was to rally very significantly, we're able to capture the return all the way up to the strike. As I mentioned, we do, let's call it 120% strike. You get to uh, capture all the way up to plus 20%, but you would not capture anything above that. So uh, these options are, um, you know, are settled at the end of the month uh, by, you know, on US dollar terms. And uh, yeah, yeah, anything above that would be settled against uh, the, the Bitcoin that, uh, you know, we would have. So the number of Bitcoin would be uh, would be reduced, but the value and the amount of bit the amount of Bitcoin we hold by number of Bitcoin will reduce, but the value of that our, our holdings would increase all the way up to where we've uh, capped out the performance. And then uh, two questions here: Can individuals trade in Bitcoin derivatives? And then uh, same question. Uh, well, same person is, is it possible to outperform Bitcoin? So uh, in, um, in for US people, uh, Ledger X was available. I don't know the status of Ledger X now, now that uh, FTX is in bankruptcy and, you know, uh, Sam Bank Freeman's under arrest. So I don't know if F Ledger X is operating as is. I think there was a discussion that Ledger X, because it was US based, it was very well ring fenced away from everything else FTX is doing. So uh, there was a discussion of it uh, potentially just being for sale. Uh, I do not know the current status, but that was a market that uh, US individuals can go and trade uh, options on uh, Bitcoin and, and a few other things, uh, futures and Bitcoins. 
Uh, offshore, Deribit is available. Binance is available. Uh, you know, there are many exchanges that do offer this. For futures, Binance is the biggest market. For options, Deribit is the biggest market. And uh, so that's doable for individuals, um, along with kind of institutional investors and funds and so forth. Uh, the question of whether, you know, someone can outperform Bitcoin, um, I think we outperformed Bitcoin, uh, you know, the past two years. And, uh, you know, we didn't outperform Bitcoin the first year because it was a raging bull market, the plus 300% market, where we were only plus 200%. So we certainly underperformed Bitcoin in year one. Uh, but year two, year three, we've outperformed Bitcoin. And I think, uh, you know, by, I would say, probably 40% in, over the past two years. So I think that that's pretty good. And, uh, you know, with a raging January, we're underperforming Bitcoin in this January. So there are periods of time where we, we would outperform and there are periods of time that we would underperform. But all, over long stretches of time, especially when it's not a raging, raging Bitcoin bull market, uh, we seem to outperform. Once again, past performance doesn't guarantee future performance. It's just simply kind of a way to see some patterns. And, um, you know, the the trade information or the return numbers that I'm talking about are for an actual fund. We actually have millions of dollars deployed in it. We're actually running these strategies. These numbers are audited. Uh, so um, up to 21, I think we're going through our 22 audit right now. So, uh, you know, these are our real performance of, uh, of uh, you know, what we can do with uh, Bitcoin derivatives. Thank you for mentioning the performance part. I know that our compliance team will be happy that you mentioned that. Uh, I should have said at the beginning that Wave Digital Assets, we are SEC registered and we take this very seriously from day one. We've leaned into how to do things uh, via compliance and regulation the right way. With that said, it looks like we are just about out of time. Simon, was there anything else that you wanted to mention that maybe we overlooked? No, not at all. If anyone would like to get in touch, please do so. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Yes, well, thank you so much, both Ben um, and Simon. We really appreciate your time and our partnership. Uh, to the audience members, we will be making a recording of this and we'll be sending that to you shortly. And please, if you have any questions afterwards, send it to us. We would love to, to answer those uh, whenever. And again, thank you both for your time this morning and early afternoon. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.